ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you with us and a warm welcome to all of you in this special session with one of the best known and most respected Indian business leaders around the world, Mr. N.R. Narayanan Murthy. Mr. Murthy, it's a privilege and an honor to have you with us today and many thanks for agreeing to have a conversation with us. A very warm welcome to you. IMI is celebrating this Foundation Day in the backdrop of continuing flow of unprecedented events and persistent uncertainty. New crises are unfolding all, all the time and businesses are forced to constantly review their assumptions and strategies. Amid unending turbulence, it is no use hunkering or tinkering and the best option seems to see opportunities in the unknown and use faster adaptability as a competitive edge. As we contemplate the ways to deal with great uncertainty today, we are pleased to have a man of vast experience and wisdom who has come through many storms and turned advers adversity into an advantage. Mr. Murthy, many congratulations on receiving the IMA Lifetime Achievement Award for Management today. You've added to the prestige of this award, which has been bestowed on some of the cream of India's transformative Indian managers over the last decades. Today, it was entirely IMA's privilege to have bestowed this award upon you. And thank you for accepting the award and for joining us today to talk about the multiple avatars of a scholar, a founder, and a reformer. You've had an exciting career, which has been full of challenges as well as achievements. Your first venture failed, but you bounced back and how with Infosys. Your career is now part of a folklore and you have inspired, educated young Indians to turn entrepreneurs. You've created India's first salaried millionaires and you ca have catalyzed the massive popularity that engineering now enjoys in the country. You are also Digital India's link to its bullock cart past. You learned and worked on computers when those were not the norm and you were the global, the globe-trotting Indian technologist much before globalization became a term. You've been a pioneer, a founder, a builder, and a beacon. And in this session, we would like to learn about this and from your stories. Ladies and gentlemen, I would, I would conduct this question and answer session. It's my great privilege to conduct this question and answer session with Mr. Narayan Murthy. And if we have time, I would like to open the floor to questions from the audience. So I would just request you to have your questions ready, and we would like to take three or four together at the end at the same time. So Mr. Mr. Murthy, my first question to you is about how you view success through your different ages of your life. You've, uh, you've, you've, you've had multiple different avatars from uh, starting a startup to, which didn't succeed and then joining Putney, then to start Infosys, and now as, as really a beacon and a, and, and, and a role model, how do you define success and how has that changed over a period of time? What can our students and managers here learn from that? Well, uh, first of all, Nikhil, before I answer that, let me say that it is absolute pleasure to be with the son of Dhruv, a good friend of mine from whom I have learned a lot, with whom I have shared so many wonderful uh, hours at CII on trips to UK and other places. And uh, it's so nice to see the next generation of Dhruv, you know, uh, being smart, efficient, you know, uh, competent and all of that. Second, it is also an absolute pleasure to have interactions with Rekha Ji because Rekha has been a pillar of this institution, while of course Srinivas and others have, be, have been steering this institution along with Rekha. Uh, it's more than 25 years since I first met her and we conducted the IMA session in Bangalore, anyway. Now, Rolf Waldo Emerson defined success as bringing smile onto the face of people. And he said many other things. But I have taken that, that is, 
if you can bring smile onto the face of people when you enter a room that is a big success because those people are not expecting anything return from you that is a very genuine emotion when people smile as psychologists say they feel happier they feel relaxed their mind is rid of jealousy their mind is rid of hatred and all of that so i would say that all along my life it thanks to my mother who was almost an unpaid mother that is she had gone only to middle school uh she said the same thing as what ralph you know waldo emerson had written and that is if you can do things so that it makes people happier around you that's the biggest success you can expect that's what i was well, thank and you that has not changed no we, we it's it's so telling for people who are joining us online that you missed the throngs of people who surrounded mr murthy as soon as he walked into the room and everywhere that he goes it's really is a you do bring a smile to everyone's face because we've seen you practice uh what you preach in a sense and you've been able to transform uh lives of so many people in multiple different ways not only as an employer but as a philanthropist and in multiple different avatars but mr burthi if i could come to a next question which is on values you've been a very key proponent of values and corporate governance um of course you you talk about the the need for it in in every different form but a, a question was brought up earlier about how what is the luxury of thinking about corporate governance for smes who are struggling to survive how do they wear the hat of corporate governance and do you see that inextricably linked with with success and how they would be able to uh, maximize their chance of succeeding in the future well it's very important to understand that <clears throat> values or the foundation on which a company can demonstrate longevity you look at any institution in our country or outside whether it's startups or whatever it is they have all demonstrated a certain value system and they have been in business for 100 years plus if you look at in the us or in europe the companies that have demonstrated longevity are the ones with a certain set of good values so values do not cost you much money however many of us feel that in the short term it means overcoming some speed in completion of the task or accepting some loss of business all of those things are in the short term but in the long term or even in the medium term even the most corrupt fellow i have seen from my own experience wants his children to have good values i don't know of any single father any single father in india or abroad who says beta you become a chore nobody has said that so therefore when you demonstrate values those people who are habitually you used to taking bribes and all of that internally they start developing respect for you so therefore i would say that values are extremely important whether you are small or big 
I want to tell you a story. One day, you know, in a house, I believe there is a husband and wife and a small child. The wife was very unhappy with the father-in-law, that is the father of the man. And one day the man got very upset. He said, tomorrow I am going to bury my father. She said, okay. So morning they got up early. The, he told the father, we are going to the forest. And the father came. And the, 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 they had a small child, three or four years old. So the child also said, I will also come with you. They went. And they went to, into the middle of the forest. And the father told, the, sorry, the, the man told the father and his child, please wait here. I am going to dig some hole. So he started digging. Then the child came to him and asked him, Papa, why are you digging this hole? So as I told you, every father wants to be honest with one's children. So he said, no, no, I want to bury my father. So then after some time he found that the child was also starting to dig a hole. So he said, hey, beta, kya kar rahe ho? Tum kya kar rahe ho? what is this? He said, no, I, you are burying your father, so I am going to bury my father. <laughs> so the point I am making is this, that if you want to develop values, you cannot say that I will reach some uh, one billion dollars or ten billion dollars and then I will start practicing values. That's why every mother, every father tells their children right from age one saying, Better be honest, work well, study well, don't waste your time, etc. etc. So, my suggestion to all the wonderful entrepreneurs is that values have to become an integral part of your life and not a function of how comfortable you are, how big your company is, how rich you are, etc. And one of the manifestations of values for a corporate person is good governance, that is good corporate governance. And the main culprit of corporate governance is creating an asymmetry of benefits between the owner managers and the rest of the shareholders. And what most owner managers who violate corporate governance, what they do is they use the resources of this company, listed company or big company, in which they hold a certain percentage of shares into building up another company where they hold 100% of the shares. That's the biggest, throughout the world, it has been established that uh, related party transactions and building up of another company where the owner-manager owns 100% from the resources of a company where, they, where he or she holds whatever, certain percentage. That is the biggest thing. And that depends on the value because the value system says that I cannot enrich myself at the expense of the other two here. The moment, that's what every parent says, that's what every teacher says. So I would say that if we have a strong value system, it is difficult, there is no doubt about it. I'm not saying we can all become gods. God is the only person who will not commit any mistake, but we all come in. But in the early days, when we commit small things, small mistakes, if we were to correct ourselves and say we will not do it again, I think that's a great thing. Uh, thank you for that very inspirational reply. It's it it truly is puts things into very correct perspective for 
all of our audience and all of us. Uh, Mr. Murthy, while there are many questions, I'd like to come to some of your personal experiences as what you've said that you were a reluctant capitalist and, uh, uh, and post your, your ex bitter experience in the communist regime in Bulgaria, uh, it cured you of your socialist uh, romanticism. Uh, the way that we've seen capitalism play out uh, is with huge inequities, uh, with where, where wealth is sustainably multiplying for some, and at the same time, while a lot of people are being are coming out of poverty, the, the disparities only seem to be getting wider. Do you believe that uh, the form of capitalism, and I, I know with your experience in multiple different fora from stakeholder capitalism, etc., do you think we need to relook at this? And how do we relook at this? Is it an individual movement? Is it something that we do as a collective? How, uh, or, or do we tweak the model that we're in right now and, and, and very frankly go to some universal basic income model? You know, I am now firmly convinced that the only way you can solve the problem of poverty in a country is through creation of jobs with better and better incomes for everybody. Second, I am also convinced that it is not the responsibility of the government to create these jobs, but it is the responsibility of entrepreneurs to convert an idea into jobs and wealth. Third, it is the responsibility of the government to create an environment where there is incentive for these entrepreneurs to create more jobs and more wealth by reasonable taxation, by creating an environment where there is honesty in the government, there is no unnecessary harassment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the motivation for all the people assembled in this room to adhere to good values cannot be the outside pressure. Yes, sometimes peer pressure does help, but the biggest force is, as Mahatma Gandhi said, is the small inner voice that is your conscience. You know, let me tell you a story of uh, uh, Kanakadasa, who was a great uh, saint from Karnataka, my home state. One day, his teacher gave a plantain each to all the children in the class and uh, he said, you know, will you people go to some place where there is nobody and eat this plantain? So after half an hour, they all came back and everybody had eaten the plantain, banana, but Kanakadasa had not eaten. So the teacher asked him, what happened to you? Could you not find a place where there was nobody? He said, sir, God is everywhere. God is watching all of us. So, so therefore, the biggest uh, force for good is self-motivation. The moment you say that this is the right way to do and this is not the wrong, this is not the right way to do, and you follow the right way, then automatically, you start with small things in life. You don't have to start with big things. You know, I one of the things that I really I feel very uncomfortable coming to Delhi is, this is one city where indiscipline is the highest. Let me give you an example. I came, I came yesterday from the airport. At a, at a red signal, there were so many cars, so many motorbikes, scooters, you know, violating the red light without a single care. I think, 
if we can't even wait a minute or two just to move forward do you think those people will wait if there is money of course they won't wait so therefore i would say that all of us have done it so we start teaching our children to demonstrate these things in small areas in 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 uh, areas where there is small return the moment you get used to following the right path where there is small return then your mind becomes stronger and stronger and stronger then you will gradually improve towards uh resisting temptation where there are big returns so i think that is where parents teachers they have such important uh, uh this thing let me tell you the story i'm sorry i'm taking a little bit of time but a story we here convey, to hear you and the <laughs> stories convey you know these things much better than just uh, words i had a teacher in my high school called kv narayan he was a very tough teacher extremely tough and he used to teach us chemistry and one day and i used to sit in the front bench one day he was he came to uh, to the class the last period whatever 4:15 to 5 pm and he was he was trying to conduct an experiment where he had to put uh, sodium chloride common salt into a test tube and then add some acid or something i don't know whatever it i have forgotten there was a friend of mine sitting next to me by name anand shrinivas prasad and he burst out laughing laughing so shri kevin narayan stopped the experiment and he came to him and said hey man what was it so funny about what i was doing you know children are generally more honest than elders so this young man of 14 years he said sir you were so stingy with common salt which is so cheap then he said something that formed the foundation for my principles for the, for the primary principle of corporate governance he said look young man this common salt belongs to this school it belongs to you it belongs to this class of 60 students it belongs to section b section c it belongs to second year first year etc etc it belongs to all the teachers it is community property therefore it is my responsibility to be very careful about how much of common salt i use because i have to treat common salt very carefully he said on the other hand at 5 o'clock the school closes you come with me to my house i will give you a glass jar full of common salt free because that's my personal property you know that taught me an unbelievable principle that is you should treat the community property better than your personal property all the all the issues of dishonesty in public governance system comes because they don't follow this principle Oh, thank you. I, I think there's a desperate need for us to look at public goods and and yeah. to all adopt it and treat it with respect. Yeah. Uh, it's it's and to be educated in that is is immensely important from a very young age. You know, inter interestingly, I was with my grandchildren last week, and they are remarked. You know, they are only nine years, whatever. They said, "Why are you people?" not looking after your commons well why is it also dirty these these are the children of 9 and 10 and a half years so what i'm saying is it is all about how we parents 
how to teach our children to look after commons, to look after public good. I mean, that, uh, your father is a good example of how he used to tell me all these uh, things. So I remain grateful to him. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, but Mr. Murthy, I, I'd like to ask a question that I think is on everyone's mind. What would you, well, we all know that you have many productive years ahead of you, as you rightly said, while accepting the award that that uh, you, you would do it to the best of your ability and, and whatever put is, whatever's put in front of you. But what would you like to be known for? What would you like to be remembered for? What is your legacy? Because you have, as a father, brought up wonderful children who have succeeded and the values that you've inculcated in them are hopefully those with which, which uh, they will cherish. As an industry leader, you've created wonderful institutions which everyone has benefited from, from shareholders to employees to the users. Uh, you've transformed an industry, and so the country has benefited and the world has benefited. And also then, you're, as a philosopher, you've been able to, to stress on certain areas which, uh, uh, which really have given people to, uh, thought, uh, food for thought. Uh, so what do you think is, or is there one aspect, or is there multiple aspects that you'd like to be known for? Well, uh, Nikhil, uh, I don't want to be known as a nice person in the Indian parlance. In India, if you are a nice person, what, you, what it means is that even if somebody is stealing something, you keep quiet and smile. I, I don't want to be like that. I stand up and very respectfully comment if it is not a problem. However, I want to be known as a fair person. What it means is, fairness is following the golden rule. That is, do unto others what you want them to do unto you. The good thing about fairness is, in a transaction, if a party loses, the other party loses, that party would leave the table saying that if I had better data, if I had done the right thing, this man would have supported me. So therefore, I try and use data and facts as much as possible. And I don't mix up acts with personalities. In other words, I don't hate a person, but I hate that act. So I want to be known as here lies a person who tried his best to be fair. Right. That's what. Right. Uh, thank you. Mr. Murthy, before I open it up to the audience for questions, I'd request uh, mics to go around. I'd like to ask a question as a technologist, as someone who led the technology movement in India, there's been so much talk about uh, artificial intelligence and movements towards chat GPT. Yeah. I took the opportunity to ask chat GPT what questions I should ask you. And, uh, and, and one of the first questions that came up was to ask Mr. Narayan Murthy uh, about what is the future for technology. Uh, so I thought that that's a good, a good place to, uh, to ask you a question while we gather some audience uh, who may wish to ask questions as well. You know, science is about unraveling the nature, while technology is about using the power of science to make life for human beings more comfortable, have better entertainment, improve productivity, solve hurdles, problems, etc. and reduce cost, etc, etc. Improve quality, etc. It doesn't matter which technology you want to look at it, right from the time wheel was invented, long time ago. Every one of these technologies made the life of human beings more comfortable. Where you have the computers, 
made our life more comfortable in certain areas. Then artificial intelligence has made our life more comfortable by becoming assistive technologies. I think there is a mistaken belief that artificial intelligence will replace human beings. No, human beings will not allow artificial intelligence to replace them because human beings have the power of mind. For example, no, no computer as we know can equal the mind of a child. You know, such experiments have been conducted many times. So as long as we use artificial intelligence in an assistive ma manner, I mean, Chandra, the chairman of Tata Sons, has written a book, right, Brigitte. That's about how you can use artificial intelligence in an assistive way. So I think countries like India should use artificial intelligence, big data, IoT, uh, cloud, cloud of course is somewhat passive, in a way that will make the life of human beings more comfortable, reduce cost and improve productivity, etc. So the future technologies will continue to aim at, may, at providing more and more free time to human beings, but no human being will be satisfied with the free time because human beings will start thinking of new things and they will become more and more busy. That's what has happened, right? We thought at one point of time that uh, all these computers will make us more free. It has not happened. We thought that mobile phones will make us uh, uh, more free. It has not happened. We can't move away from our mobile phones. <laughs> That's the reality. That is because human mind is the most flexible instrument that ever exists in the world, in this planet. And it also has higher and higher aspirations. So doesn't matter what technology you will invent, the human being, the human mind is always a step ahead and becomes the master of that technology. So I, I personally feel that the focus of technology will be on making the life of human beings more comfortable, more productive, less costly, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. That's a, that's a future we all look forward to, not getting more busy, but uh, hopefully solving a lot of problems through technology. Could I ask Srini to give the concluding remarks, please? Most respected uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Nikhil and friends, uh, this has been an extraordinary session. And uh, I feel very privileged to wrap up this session because here is a man I deeply admire and respect. Uh, last year, I was... Uh, under the same IMA banner, I was privileged to have a fireside chat with Mrs. Sudha Murthy, who I also share a lot of respect for. And I saw an overarching similarity in you know, both the fireside chats. And the similarity was, don't run after money, be fair to people, okay, focus on your work. And the new thing that I learned today, and what an outstanding objective it is to have for any business that you operate is put smile on the face of people. I think we owe, owe it to you, Mr. Narayan Murthy, for this amazing session. I learned a lot and so have the audience. Uh, you have been a true inspiring leader in India. Uh, human mankind in India is blessed to have people like you and your wife. As you said, there's a lot to be achieved in India, but I think the good news is that there are extraordinary people like you and Bunker Roy and Dilip Asbe who are putting smile on so many people's faces that I think we are extremely positive about where India is going to go. I actually was tempted to ask you, and I got the answer from you in an indirect way, as to when you had set up Infosys as a founder, 
would you have ever imagined that you would create a 17 billion dollar empire and i think the answer is that money was never a criteria for you you wanted to make a difference to other people's lives and in that journey you achieved 17 billion dollars from 40000 dollars so i think ladies and gentlemen i think I don't need to wrap up this session in a way that I normally do because so much has been conveyed. And one thing that really touched me is you used the very powerful mechanism which my grandmother used to tell me is storytelling. And I think that really remains in your heart and in your mind because I think it's an old age Indian tradition to tell stories and through those stories you get value systems built in. So I think that was really, really educative. From the bottom of my heart and on behalf of IMA, I would like to thank you, express my gratitude for coming all the way from Bangalore to be with us today. It's an honor and a privilege for IMA to give you the Lifetime Achievement Award. And we hope that IMA can always count on your sage advice and counsel in the future in our journey towards management excellence. Thank you once again. Thank you.